Please join me in the call to worship. We have come here seeking to worship the God of all creation. We have come to stand on holy ground. We have come to sing God's praises as sunflowers and lavenders sing God's praise with their blooming. We have come to sing praises to our of the spirit like the flowing waters of the Farmington River. We have come to open ourselves to the Holy Spirit. May we experience the God of creation in this sacred place. Now let's sing together stars and planets flung in orbit. Um, uh, number 556, 67, sorry, 567, the black hymnal. Good morning, church. It's a joy to be back with you this morning and to be able to share a bit of God's word and praise um, with you. I invite you to join me in our morning prayer. We who have lost our sense and our senses, our touch, our smell, our vision of who we are, we who frantically force and press all things without rest for body or spirit, hurting our earth and injuring ourselves, we call a halt. We want to rest. We need to rest and allow the earth to rest. We need to reflect and to rediscover the mystery that lives in us that is the ground of every unique expression of life, the source of the fascination that calls all things to communion. We declare a Sabbath, a space of quiet, for simple being and letting be, for recovering the great forgotten truths,
for learning how to live again. May this time of worship be the Sabbath rest we yearn for. Amen. And now I invite us to embody God's love by saying to one another, peace be with you. And I also invite you to say, peace be with you to those who are streaming on Facebook. So will you greet one another? Spirit of the living God, turn on the light of truth and wake up our hearts by the word we now declare and ponder. In ancient pages, let us find fresh life, fresh hope, and fresh courage for witness in your world. The scripture this morning are selected verses from Genesis 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let us separate the waters from the waters. And it was so, and God called the dome sky. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the waters seas. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, planting yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created great sea monsters, excuse me, and every living creature that moves of every kind, with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of every kind. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in God's own image. In that image, God created them. Male and female, God created them. God blessed them, and God sent to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God saw everything that God had made, and indeed it was very good. Will you pray with me? Holy One, you call us here as we seek to be one with you, to know you more deeply, to live our lives more faithfully, to be indeed for a moment at rest and at peace. Grant that in this time together, we might hear your voice, that we might be challenged and yet also given peace. 
grant this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I have to figure this out. Is this on? Some of you know I've never been much for pulpits. So I want to have a conversation with you this morning about that scripture text, which is familiar to probably almost all of you. So familiar that you may not even hear all of what is in it. You know how with a familiar text, you're so used to it that it just sort of rolls over you. And I've been spending a lot of time with this text because of my work with Third Act a movement in Connecticut and across the country of elders, and I am now a senior elder um, working on issues of democracy and climate. And I find myself continually returning to the story in Genesis, the story of our creation, the story of Earth's creation, because I think we need to reroot ourselves in that story. In this story, I want to start with what came at the end of this passage, the creation of humankind. And then we'll work backward in the story. You see, here we have in Genesis the word that humankind was created in God's image and God decided to give us, as human beings, responsibility for the stewardship of the earth. Indeed, in the act of our creation, the one job that God gave humanity was the stewardship of the earth and all its life. And so, we cannot come to this day in 2024 without asking ourselves, how are we doing with our stewardship of the earth? You know where I'm going. Every single person here knows where I'm going because we all sense in our bones and in our being that things are changing with our climate, with our planet, and with people all over the globe. The technical words that are used in Genesis are that we have been given dominion over the earth and all its living creatures. It's my contention that we have been misspelling dominion for a long time. We've inserted other letters that have turned it into domination. And we have thought that by our dominating the earth, that we would be somehow living the dominion that God has charged us with. But the truth is dominion is not domination. Dominion is stewardship. Dominion is the right relationship of those who lead with that which is led, with those who steward with that which is stewarded. It is about a right way of being that, in, that enables the full thriving of earth and of all life and of all people. It is my judgment and my guess is that for 90% of you, and I'm only giving the 10% because maybe there are some here who would disagree, in my judgment, we are failing. We have failed miserably. Now, I grew up in northwestern Connecticut in a rural village, not unlike North Granby, um, a village where my grandparents were farmers, a village where I was related to 300 of the people out of the 450 <laughs> in the village, a village where I was very active in my local church growing up, and indeed our Pilgrim Fellowship group was 
larger than the number of adults in worship on Sunday morning, and I've often wondered to myself, why didn't we just take over the church? <laughs> we could have, because we had 30 or 35 kids on Sunday evening, and there were only 18 or 20 in worship on Sunday mornings. So I grew up in a context in which I spent almost all my waking hours when I wasn't in school running in the fields and playing in the forest and leaping from boulder to boulder and just loving God's creation. And I pray that kids today are able to have those experiences. You probably had some of those experiences when you were growing up. And I hope that your families are having those experiences because creation and God's earth are such a gift to us. The beauty of this day gives us grace in our hearts. The beauty of this day spurs us into the rest of our lives. And yet at the same time, if I'm going to be the preacher I'm called to be, I have to name some of the ways in which our earth is in trouble. My internet was popping full of maps today of the fires from Oregon to New Mexico. It looks like the entire West is on fire. Now that's an exaggeration, of course. But those maps make it clear. Now there have always been fires. Of course there have always been fires. But these are beyond what have always been. And then there have been photos coming out of the Philippines. Have any of you ever been to the Philippines? I've been there. And I know that it is a land which lives close to the ocean. It is a land that is used to being close to the sea, and the people are, but they've recently experienced a terrible, terrible storm. And the flooding is beyond anything they've ever experienced before, and people are being driven out of their homes. We know that 43 million children are already displaced from their homes because of climate change across the world. 20,000 children a day are displaced from their homes because of climate change, from storms and fires and famine. Now, I can go on with a ton of bad news, but I'm supposed to be preaching the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I did this last time I was here, right? It was a tough sermon. And I seem to be caught in tough sermons. And so I apologize for that. And yet, we cannot hear the good news if we don't know what the bad news is that the good news needs to take on. But I do not need to go on and on. You know in your bones that we are in perilous times that we have decisions to make as humanity that we've never had to make before. Now, I have a friend in the climate movement whose comment about that is this. We are so privileged. We get to be the generation who saves the future. And you know, I really believe that. I believe that we are the generation that has the responsibility and the capacity to turn this around. I believe it can be turned around, but it's going to take all of us to do that. I believe that we can stop our addiction to fossil fuels because that is what is driving climate change. You know, here we live. Now, somebody's going to take offense at this. I'm used to that. But here we live in the insurance capital of the world. And our insurance companies in Hartford and greater Connecticut are investing in and underwriting fossil fuel projects time after time after time. 
And yet those same insurance companies are then turning around and withholding policies from people who need homeowners' policies in places that are at risk by the very expenditure of fossil fuels that is causing the climate crisis and causing the insurance companies to have catastrophic claims that have doubled from one quarter to another. The contradictions in our life need to be addressed. We truly are addicted to fossil fuels. And yet, fossil fuels are not the only answer to our need for energy. There is much hope on the horizon. We know, for instance, that the cost of renewable energy has declined by 90% in the past decade. What would have cost you so much and been impossible 10 years ago is now within reach for solar or for wind or for geothermal or for, or for harnessing the tides. And so there is hope on the horizon. And you and I can be a part of turning this around. We can't, you know, it's a big ship. You can't turn it fast. And so we have to do what we can do now in these next four or five or six years to make a huge difference to, to, to change the course of Earth and humanity. One of the deepest worries that I have as an as a ordained minister of the United Church of Christ is the challenges that are coming in climate migration. We already know that millions of people have been driven from their homelands, from the villages in which they have always lived, and are now forced into camps where they are having to live without owning property, without any means of, of income, without food. The starvation is huge. How are we going to behave as a nation when people come to us and want to come here? How are other nations going to behave? Who will we be? What will be the core values that will drive us in our decision making? Those are questions that are crucial to our lives and to the life of the Earth. Can we turn this around soon enough to avoid that climate migration? Probably not. But can we turn it around soon enough that my little identical twin great-granddaughters who were born on July 1st might have a future? I believe we can. And I believe that there is indeed hope for us. Now, if we return to the scripture, you will see that early in the text, God says, sees that, that the deep is dark and roiling and, and is in need of light, and so God creates light. And then with that light begins to create the earth as we know it. And after a few other creations like bringing vegetation upon the earth and so forth, there comes this passage, this one line, basically, in which, in which the ancients tell us that God created the sun and the moon, that God hung the sun and the moon in the skies in order to establish night and day and to provide for all that all the vegetation and living creatures of the earth would need. And I believe that in that text is a part of our, the source of our hope, that God gave us this gift of the sun and the moon and the tides and the winds so that we could harness them. And in harnessing energy instead of burning it, we can have a future. Now, I'm not here to tell you that you, in particular, must go and put solar panels on your home. That would be silly, although I would hope that as many of us would as can. 
and I live at Seabury where we have geothermal and solar energy and heat pumps and all of those kinds of things, and I am very grateful for that. But I am saying that as public policy and as corporations, we need to have the big institutions of our lives turn their backs on fossil fuels. Many of you are sitting there saying, well, that's all wonderful and idealistic. Come on, Davida, get real. But I am getting real. And I have been studying this, and I have been reading the science, and I believe that within the next five years, we can, if we commit ourselves, turn this around, at least slow it down enough that the brilliant, brilliant scientists and technologists who are right now inventing and creating more ways for things to be accessible to us will make it possible for us to actually regain life on Earth the way we remember it. I remember summers when I could just go out in that little village of Northfield and run in the fields and have the greatest time and come home and yes, a little bit soaking wet from all my running because I never went anywhere walking. I ran everywhere. But now, as an elder, most of these days, we are not encouraged to go outdoors. I yearn, I yearn for those days. And that's why I'm working so hard to restore right dominion and right stewardship of God's earth. The future is possible to be full of potential for us to be the kind of people and, and the caring people for all of the earth and for all of God's people. There is hope. There is possibility, but it will not happen if I and a few others are the only ones. It's going to take all of us to turn this around and to make a difference in this world that God has given us to make use of the sun and the moon and the tides and the winds and the waters to increase our capacity to be the ones who share in the stewardship of Earth in powerful ways. It is possible, and God has given us the gift to make it possible. Will you pray with me? Holy One, gracious God, these are difficult words and yet there is so much possibility in all that you have given us. Grant that we might band together to be fully your people, calling for right dominion and right stewardship, to be your people who seek to live faithfully, to be your people set in the midst of this world to help transform it into the kind of world that you intended it to be. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
Good morning. It's very lovely to be here this morning. Beth Matlack with Linda Betch serving as deacons. Uh, this morning, um, I, I walked around but didn't notice anyone having any prayer requests. If there are any, please let us know. Um, I'm hoping for us to um, remember in our prayers Lisa Reinhardt this morning, who um, uh, with her boyfriend, she is with her boyfriend Ralph, and he has been recuperating from heart surgery. And um, there have been some complications, but as of yesterday, um, he seems to have turned a cor corner. So we, we hold them in our prayers. Are there any others? Yes. I'll share gratitude to Paula and Whitey Friday night hosting an electrifying social gathering at their house. Well, wonderful. <clears throat> yeah. I'm sorry that I missed that. Um, we had another commitment, but I'm sure it was a lovely evening. Any other prayer requests? Yes? Of course. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. We're happy to hear that you've, you're progressing so well. Are there any other requests? Yes. I can say a prayer for our democracy and also for our environment after that wonderful sermon. Yes, Dick. Thank you. Thank you for that. A prayer for our democracy and for the lovely sermon from Davida this morning to heighten our our consciousness about um, the environmental issues. Thank you, Davida. And it is with a very heavy heart that I ask for prayers for our longtime friends, Barbara and Mike Funk, former members of First Church, who lost a son unexpectedly this week. Um, they are obviously shattered. It is Troy Funk, their middle son. Ken and I are longtime friends, and we've watched their sons grow up. And um, we ask, I ask for you to hold them in your hearts and remember them in their, and in their time. Thank you, then. Um, let us be together in the spirit of prayer. Holy God, we come before you in prayer lifting to you the joys and concerns, the hopes and dreams of our lives. May we also be open to your voice in our lives, that we may see with new eyes and hear with new ears the direction you will have us go. Hear our prayers for those whose lives have touched us, those who are in pain, those who are ill, those who grieve, May we touch their lives, not only through our prayers, but through our actions as well. Guide us, bless us, uplift us, and hold us, for we are your children called to our purpose in your world. Listen now to the prayers hidden in our hearts in the silence of the sanctuary. And now let us continue using the words that Jesus taught his disciples. O Holy One who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, so also this summer, you may already be aware that we are um, 
we have uh, a worship practice of discernment. Each of us is invited to respond to the same question as a way of getting to know each other and listening um, and learning our hopes and dreams for the entire church. The question is printed on a small insert paper in your bulletin. At the end of this service this morning, you can bring your response forward and place it in the offering plate at the front of the sanctuary. And together we are discerning who we are as a church and we need to hear all of our voices. So our question for today is, how do you hope GCC will respond to the climate crisis now and in the coming years? For us to consider what we would hope to see happening here within this realm. So thank you if you can um, participate in this and, and leave your small slip of paper with us this morning. Um, and now would you please join me in the prayer of commitment. Soil is a home for seeds, nourishing and sustaining them. Soil contains all of life and is a precious resource. Bless the soil of Granby Congregational Church, O oh God, that it may support your great gift of life. Bless all who work and care for the soil. Amen. Now let us rise in spot, spirit or body and join in singing hymn number 582.
And now, my friends, go in grace and peace to be God's people. Go out into this earth, into this world, and be witnesses of God's intent. Go now and know the love of God in your hearts. Amen. Amen.